Okay, hello. Here we are again. My name is Jay Brown. This is Yoga Talks Podcast. Welcome to you if you're new, if you're returning. Thank you. And how's it going? What are you doing right now? I'm betting from the majority of the emails I get that there's a lot of you right now who are in your car and you're on your way to get to a class or maybe you're even on like on a subway and you got headphones on, but you're, you're right now in this moment on your way to go teach a yoga class. And if that's you, I just want to take a moment to express some deep solidarity with you because I really have returned back to what I feel are like the roots of being a, a yoga teacher in this like modern day. If you've been listening, you know, I got back from Japan and I'm, I'm settled into my new life. And maybe you've done that where you, when you travel to some place and it takes like a week or so before you like settle into that place, you know, and you're actually there. Well, I've settled into being here and here is my new life in the Lehigh Valley. And I took a week off, as I mentioned last week, and that was really good. I just rested and tended to myself and like did some practice, which was really great. And this week is the first week that I taught a couple of classes. I taught one just regular drop-in class, and then I taught two workshops at these two centers that I'm teaching at, Easton Yoga in Easton, Pennsylvania, and Yukato Yoga in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And it was really interesting. My first class wasn't a workshop. It was just eight people who I didn't know. Actually, there was one person there who was a podcast listener. I think her name was Annie, maybe. And forgive me if I'm forgetting your name, but I really appreciated that you came. There was one podcast listener, which was cool to have my first class. There was one person there who I felt like kind of knew me, but everybody else there didn't know me and they didn't come necessarily for what I teach. They just came for a yoga class. And I was like, oh yeah, right. That's what that's like. (laughs) It's been a long time. I had that center in Brooklyn for a long time. I always knew at least a couple of people and it was my place and everybody knew what that was about. And even you know, I taught a workshop today and I taught one yesterday and they went wonderful because people came knowing and interested in what I was offering. But that first class, I I really had to work. It's work, you know? I enjoyed it immensely. I felt like, right, this is what it's about. And so... If you are one of those people who are on your way to grind out another yoga class with whoever shows up, I just want to be sending you a little bit of love and support and solidarity. Recently, I I heard a friend of mine talking about yoga teachers and kind of, I don't know, casting yoga teachers in a not-so-great light. And certainly there's a lot of criticisms to dish around, but... I also think it's quite an admirable thing to do in certain regards. I think wanting to facilitate health and being well in yourself and in other people as a focus and a purpose in life and hopefully some kind of contribution to more health and equilibrium on the planet on the whole That's not a bad thing. That's a beautiful thing. So thanks to you if you're doing that. And thanks to my new friends here in the Lehigh Valley. It was really, really wonderful to feel welcomed into a yoga community. And and I felt that way. I felt supported and welcomed. And it's pretty cool. And right now, it is like incredible outside. It's an idyllic day. It's like, 75 degrees and sunny in the latter part of October and it's just beautiful up here. So I'm feeling good and I don't know how you're feeling, whoever you are that's listening, but I want to try to 
put a little bit of the good feeling that I have in myself right into this microphone if I can at all. Sort of send it right out into your brain through your ear holes. Oh, and you know what else? <laughs> now I, I actually I know why I'm feeling so full of gratitude, not just because of the positive teaching experiences, but actually because of a really, really scary thing that happened just the other day. It was this moment where my life could have gone in a terrible direction all in one instant. My wife and my three-year-old daughter were at the top of the stairs. And my wife was struggling with this window, trying to get it to close or something. And my daughter was standing next to her and wanting her attention and bugging her. And, and then um, I was downstairs uh, not right at the base of the stairs, but just a little bit away from the base of the stairs, a little bit into the hallway that is formed by the staircase. And all I heard was my wife scream, no. And I turned and looked and basically, I guess my daughter had backed up and fallen backwards down the stairs. And I looked up and the first thing I saw was my wife. And it was that thing that you've seen on TV or in the movies in that horrible moment when the person like looks up to the sky and says, no, like that's what my wife did. She literally did that thing that you've seen in the movie. I had this image of her screaming to the heavens, no. And then the next thing I saw was my three-year-old daughter tumbling down the stairs. And without thinking, I I ran around and got up maybe like two or three stairs before I got to where she was on her way down. And I reached down and grabbed her and pulled her into my arms and took her down the stairs and held her. And she was fine. She was fine. She was crying and very upset. And it took a long time for us to calm her down. But she's okay. Like she doesn't even have any noticeable bruises. And she kind of hit, like it seemed like she hit her cheek, but like, it was, it was, she was okay. She, she was okay. But it could have gone a different way, you know? It could have gone a very different way. And it was just by accident that I happened to be down there even to keep her from hitting the bottom, you know? And it was just like this moment, my wife and I just keep looking at each other ever since. It's like, Everything could have gone a different direction in that moment. But we were spared and everybody's fine and it's a beautiful day. And I'm a lucky, lucky person. So I just, I talk about this a lot that you don't want to have to have some horrible tragedy be the thing that helps you feel appreciative for life, you know? And, uh, find ways and that's what practice is about for me a lot is like proactively bring about that kind of gratitude and appreciation for just the simple fact of it we're here we're existing it's quite incredible in and of itself even with all of its difficulty and pain so for whatever that's worth to you my friends who are listening which I'm deeply appreciative of. And thank you so much for your emails. Please keep them coming. They are really uh, fueling me and sustaining me. It's wonderful to know that you're out there. All right, well, who are we talking to today? We're talking to Kimberly Wilson. And I didn't really know Kimberly before I spoke to her. A friend of mine, Pleasant Saliki, who's been on the podcast, reached out to me because Kimberly was selling her yoga centers in the Washington, D.C. area right about the same exact time that I sold my center in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. She thought it would be interesting if we spoke. And it certainly was for me. Kimberly has a very different background and story and The way that she ran her centers was very different from me. We have a pretty good conversation about that. I mentioned last week that Kimberly is a veteran podcaster, and I think you'll hear that. It's interesting for me. I think folks who listen to this podcast and then come on 
have a sense often that I'm a little bit, if you haven't noticed, unstructured. <laughs> like I don't write out a bunch of questions. And so I think if someone comes on like expecting like they're going to be interviewed, it doesn't always, it feels a little bit, well, what's going on? But eventually I think we definitely settle in. I did. I think she did. And we get to talking and all kinds of interesting stuff to hear her perspective and how she came to what she's doing. I think there's a lot there. And you're going to listen to it today. Before we do, let me drop my stuff. I'm going to be at Riverstone Yoga in Terrytown, New York, November 5th. I'm going to be in Doylestown, Pennsylvania, just outside of Philadelphia at Dragonfly Yoga on January 6th. And I am going to be in London at Tri Yoga Camden, January 12th through 14th. You can find out about those gigs and all of my other stuff, my blog and the archives of this podcast and my online video stuff. I've got DVD downloads. I've got an online course. I've got a live stream subscription. I live streamed my first class from the Lehigh Valley just the other day. So if you want to get on on those live stream classes, which now has 24-hour access, all of that stuff can be found at jbrownyoga.com. Please show some support for the podcast if you've been digging on it. It would be very cool if you hooked us up. You can do that in like a monetary way by going to a blogger podcast page and making a direct donation. Or you could also just go to iTunes or what they are now calling Apple Podcasts and write a review and give us some stars. Those gestures are really, really helpful and much appreciated. Okay, I will touch base with you on the other side. I'll let you know who's coming on next, but I think that's fine for now, and we should just get to this talk that I had with Kimberly Wilson. Hey, Kimberly. How are you? I'm doing okay. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I hear you great. Oh, I'm trying up some new new setup here. I know you you're a podcast yourself, so you can understand. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're, you're you're letting me try out some new equipment today, so awesome. <laughs> cool. So, how's it going today? Good. So far, so good. How about you? I'm okay. All in all, I kind of got up a little bit later than I thought because I went to bed a little bit later than I thought. But sometimes that happens. Absolutely. Yeah. When are, are you on the East Coast? Or? Um, I, I am on the East-ish Coast. I just moved recently from Brooklyn to Eastern Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So we're in the time, same time zone at least, right? <laughs> yes, we are. It's, it's not too early, but I had some other work. So in any case, I was rushing around, but I'm settling now with you, which feels good. 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 <laughs> and um, it's fun. You know, I have a friend, I don't know if you know her directly, her name is Pleasant Salicki, and she emailed me after I wrote this blog post about um, closing my center down, or selling my center. And uh, she, saw, she said, oh, I think you should talk to Kimberly, she would be a great conversation. And so I like jumped over and like looked at your websites, and I immediately thought she was right. Um, it seems like both of us are sitting here now without a worry that there will be a text on our phone from a yoga teacher needing a sub today. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> right? Neither of us have that on us after a long time. How, how long did you have your yoga center? Uh, 18 years. Wow, see, you almost doubled me. And before we get to that part, though, I also noticed that, as I mentioned in my email to you, that you've been podcasting for a really long time. Yeah, 12 years. Can you believe it? I mean, that's like way ahead of the curve. Like I didn't even <laughs> discover podcasts until like a few years ago, really. So how did you, like what came first? I know you do other stuff too. Like you have like a clothing line and you do retreats and you do animals. You like all the stuff that you do. So which, which came first? Did the podcast yeah. or did the clothing or did the yoga center come first? What was your first thing? Studio. So studio is the baby. And then from there was like... Clothing line, books, nonprofit, podcasts, kind of all like in the 02 to 06 range. Okay. So then let's go back more to the beginning then of when you started the center, which you said was 18 years ago. 
So let me do a little math if I can, if that's at all possible. 2001. Is that right? Nin- nope, 99, but 99. you were close. <laughs> See, <laughs> my, my brain didn't fire right there. All right, so 1999. Wow, that, that was very early times for yoga. What was the yoga scene like in D.C., right? Is that where you are? Yeah, I'm in D.C. It was pretty much non-existent. You know, I mean, there was uh, a couple, there were a couple people doing things kind of in their homes. And then there was one larger center in D.C. that I knew of that I hadn't gone to, though, that was called um, Unity Woods. And it's kind of like a staple in the area that's uh, Iyengar yoga. So, yeah. And whenever I started, you know, I had done some Anusara training, some... Um, Ashtanga training and some integral yoga therapy training. And so vinyasa wasn't a word yet. And so I'd be like, oh, we're an Ashtanga Anusara Kripalu blend because my integrative yoga therapy teacher had studied at Kripalu. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So I'm like, and then vinyasa came out as a word. And I'm like, oh, thank God. I don't have to like go into this long explanation as to like what in the world I'm doing over here. (laughs) Wow. Okay. So early times. And how did you first get to yoga? Yes, I was living in Colorado, 1996. So after college, I backpacked for a few months. I'm from Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And then I moved to Colorado to kind of to ski, take a year off before grad school. And I was, you know, I belonged to a gym there. And they had a yoga class. And at that point, you know, I was seeing yoga on the covers of Shape Magazine, you know, is like a, a great thing to do for your mind and body. And of course, I'm stepping off of the aerobics craze, you know, actually the steps from the, uh, you know, what was it called? The step aerobics or whatever. It was a nightmare. It was so hard. And, um, you know, so I was like, ooh, something that's good for not just like physical, but also mental. And so I took my first class at a gym in Silverthorne, Colorado in April 1996. Okay, what was that class like? It was so chill. It was like cat and cow poses. It was child's pose. I don't know if we really did any sun salutations. It was an hour of just like really chill. And on those blue mats, you know, those foamy mats that they have at the gym. Mm -hmm. Oh, the squishy ones. The squishy squishy ones. ones. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Well, what did you, is your impression, because I know at one time there was kind of like, a lot of folks who were like aerobics instructors who would go away for a weekend and then come back and teach a yoga class. Was it more like that or was it somebody rooted in some kind of tradition or something? You know, I really don't know. It was an older woman and there were a lot of kind of retirees there in the class. And, I, you know, I have no idea. I don't know what her experience level was because, yeah, there really weren't yoga teacher trainings mm-hmm. uh, around then. So I don't know. You know, she may have just been somebody who had practiced for years kind of on her own. Um, definitely was not like a, 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 a class that we would have now. Right. And, and so... After you started going to those yoga classes, did you like get into it right away? Like I know a lot of people I talk to who've had yoga related uh, projects and businesses for many years. It's like they kind of knew right away when they first went to yoga that this was going to be their thing. Was that your case? Yeah, initially, um, immediately I was like, oh, this is kind of fun. And I would like to teach this. Like that was my initial take. And it's funny because I was not an aerobics teacher. I'd never done anything like that. But, you know, I just kind of felt like, oh, this would be really great. Uh, You know, because of course the teacher did the practice with us, which I have like through all my teacher trainings, highly encourage our teachers do not do that. Um, You know, it's it's, it's not our time to practice. It's our time to teach. Right. But Mm -hmm. I didn't know that then. And so I was you know, I was like, oh my gosh, so you get to exercise, you get to help people, you know, it's, I was just like, this would be amazing. And Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so a few years later, I went through my first teacher training, again, so hard to find in 1999. Right. So were you, did you find your way to a center or were you still just taking classes at the gym? 
So whenever I moved to the D.C. area, I took from a swami, actually. Again, so hard to find yoga classes back then. Mm -hmm. And so I was living out in Alexandria, Virginia, and there was a swami who had this like little center uh, with yoga classes and meditation classes. And the great thing was we started every class with 30 minutes of Shavasana. I was like, this is amazing. Um, 30 minutes? Yeah, 30 minutes. That's how we started and and at the end again very chill and then at the end he served a homemade chai and i got the recipe and that's what i started doing whenever i started my yoga studio in my mm-hmm. living room and um, it's and amazing it was just- how those little rituals stick with you like i have oh. two or three of those that like one of my first teachers did with me that i still do to this day yeah, right? You're like, oh, it's just so sweet, you know? Yeah. And it was like making this huge concoction before a yoga class. But it was it was just a really nice touch. And you know, we'd all sit around and no one really knew what to say to each other uh, in this little center. And, you know, maybe there were like five or eight of us in class. And we would just sip our chai out of these mugs and then and then head, head home. And so I did that for maybe like a year. And then when I moved into the city... You know, again, I didn't really find a studio, so I'd go out in the suburbs to some of the larger centers to try to get my yoga on. Mm -hmm. All right. So you start to go some other centers, and then at what point do you decide that you want to do a training, or you found your way to a training, or you were, after doing these classes with the Swami, did you move on to other kind of uh, teachers from there? Yeah, so I found a teacher who was in the D.C. area who was also doing something with her husband in their home. And so I went and took a few classes with her, and she told me that she had gone through a teacher training that was the Shivananda, right, that was, um, you know, in the Bahamas is where she'd gone. So she went away for a month to do that. And I was like, oh, I just can't do a month. And I remember kind of looking through At that time, we had a local association, Mid-Atlantic Yoga Association. And I remember looking through the flyer and seeing that there was a teacher here in the area who was bringing in her teacher uh, to do a few weekends of training. And so I, I immediately called her. There was, of course, there weren't websites then. And, you know, you would send in a check for your registration. So anyway, I called her and then I did that in June of 1999. And the tricky thing was, really, it was mainly philosophy. So when I was finished with that, I didn't really know how to teach a class. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, it was, it was that was my launching off point for teaching. I see. And during that time, what were you, what were you doing when you weren't at the yoga center? So I was a paralegal whenever I went through the training. So I, whenever I moved to DC, I went through the Georgetown paralegal program. That's kind of what brought me here. Uh And then I worked at an intellectual property firm for a few years, trying to change the world one trademark at a time. Wow. Uh, Yeah. Oh, so that's uh, very interesting. You know, intellectual (laughs) property rights, which is an issue for yoga teachers in general, but, uh, yes. mm -hmm. Well, but you know, the interesting thing was it was trademarks. That was my thing. So I didn't really know kind of like the written material sort of stuff. I didn't tell touch copyrights and I didn't touch patents. It was all trademarks. So like, Mm -hmm. you know, some of our clients were Cirque du Soleil whenever they were trademarking O, you know, which was one of their uh, performances. So, you know, I did that for a couple of years and I was just like, oh my God, is this really what I'm supposed to do for the next 40 years? And then I get to retire and then I get to live. And so I was like, okay, well, at least I'm going to take this training and this is something I can do on the side. And then I left the law firm to go back to Georgetown to help run the paralegal program. And then that is when I started the studio a few months later. I was just like, well, let me just start doing something. Because at that point, I was kind of subbing around town at like gyms. And and I thought, this is kind of fun. You know, I enjoy doing this much more than I do my day job. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of the, the launch of it all in October of 1999, inviting strangers into my living room around a fire, doing some yoga and having homemade chai and cookies at the end. You see, I, I love that. Cause I know I was getting into yoga right around that time. I started practicing in like 96. I started teaching right around the same time as you. And I remember to me, it felt like a counterculture move, you know, like I wasn't working as a paralegal. I was like waiting tables and doing crap jobs, but it felt to me like, wow, this could be like a way for me where I don't have to be in an office and I get to do something that I feel good about. 
Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then the crazy thing is, right, which you probably have recognized and we'll get to this, but then you're like hustling, going all over town, you know, trying to teach these classes, teaching other people to relax. And you're like, you know, schlepping from point A to point B um, in this new life that you think is like, oh, this will be so great when I leave my day job and then I do this full time. And you realize like how much I know. Work it is. <laughs> well, I think like it starts out as a practice and like it does something for you personally. And then you feel like, oh, and you see the other teachers that you're going to and what they do. And you sort of want to model after that. You're like, oh, I could do something like that or my version of something like that. And then you start doing it and that's exciting. And then at some point, though, it starts to become more of like a livelihood or you're trying to make it a livelihood. And I remember back then, though, there was definitely a time where it it felt to me like this kind of blissful time where everything was booming and people were calling me for private lessons and I like made more money back then at a certain time uh, and I didn't have a sense of it. But then it, it did sort of change and at some point after a little while, a year or two, it starts to really become more of like your work, you know. Right. And that's when I think you're right. It does start to become a grind and you, you had to teach it more than one place and you had to hustle from place to place. And it did start to become a profession. And I think that's true for like the industry on the whole, you know, like it, it started to solidify into a profession more and more as time went on. Right, which is exciting, right? You're like, oh my gosh, like Christy Turlington, I think in like O2 was on the cover of Time Magazine doing yoga. And you're like, oh my gosh, it's a thing. Like people right. are, you know, like getting into this and they know what yoga means whenever I say I teach yoga, mm-hmm. um, which was great. Uh-huh. Right? I remember I remember that's a joke I always make. It's not a joke. It's actually a real thing that in the old days, if I was at a party and someone asked me what I do and I said, I'm a yoga teacher, they would say, what's that? Right. And at a certain point, after Christy Turlington was on the cover and Madonna and Sting were all publicly talking about their yoga practice, at a certain point, if I was at a party and I said, uh, I'm a yoga teacher, they would say, what kind of yoga? Right, right. Yes, (laughs) yes. And you're like, wow, there's been a cultural shift. Yeah, yeah, true. And so so you're you're like me. We kind of rode that wave. We kind of came into it just before it really kind of came into the mainstream, it seems. And then as it did, we both kind of just made a, made a life of it. Right. Right. And so how do you, you're, you're bopping around, uh, teaching at different places, subbing, you're doing paralegal work. When, do you ever have like a home studio or a place that you take some regular classes at? When does it start to become more of like your regular, your regular gig or when does the, 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 it start to tilt in that direction maybe? Yeah. Well, so, you know, and it all happened quite fast, right? So I went through that training in June and then I started my own home studio in October of, this is all of 1999. But, you know, during that year and maybe a year before I was taking classes at some centers out in the suburbs where you actually had to sign up for series. So it'd be like a 12 week series or something along those lines. So that was where I was kind of dabbling a little bit. And And are those like home studio, I'm sorry to interrupt, but are those like someone's home studio, like someone's like living room or something like that? No, they were centers, and they're actually they're still around. And um, but they, yeah, they were like the larger centers, the okay. kind of the only ones that that I knew of, at least that were around. And but they were outside of DC. Okay, and so at some point, um, when does when does do you stop doing the paralegal work and just start trying to make yoga the way that you're going to pay your rent? Yeah, so October 1989, invite strangers into my living room, and then by July the following year, 2000, I went away and I did a two-week, 200-hour teacher training out in California. I came back, and I'm, like, sitting in my cubicle going, this, like, sucks. Like, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to do yoga, you know, like, full-time yoga. And then I gave my two weeks notice. You know, I just kind of did the math. I was like, okay, if I can teach this many classes, I can at least cover my rent, my car payment, my insurance, and my groceries, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I just figured that out, and I, and I did it. So that was July of 2000. So I've kind of been somewhat, you know, on my own since then. Okay, so at that point, 
do you get some regular gigs at different centers? You get yourself a schedule worked up or you, you said you're doing classes out of your home. Yeah, I was doing classes out of my home. And at that point, I'd gone from two a night to maybe like um, or two a week in one night to maybe like eight a week in my living room. Mm. And then, yeah, I was teaching at gyms, gyms around the around the district, you know, working, of course, seven days a week. You know, I remember one day I would have five classes in a day. Like, that's insanity. Now, I mean, I can't even teach five classes in a week. Like, I just don't have the stamina for that, much less than a day, you know? <laughs> well, there was a time when I remember doing 20 in a week for a while, and then I reduced it greatly. I could do four or five and it wouldn't be a problem for me at this point. But still, I'm with you. Like, that's five in a day is way too much. Like, I could do a back-to-back, but any more than three in a day seems absurd. Right, right. And I know it works for people. And I think when you're younger, you know, you yeah, have a little yeah. more stamina. Different stages yeah. of life. Totally, totally. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I remember I would get on the metro and, like, head out to Maryland. And then I'd teach at, like, a country club in Virginia. And, you know, they are just right across the border. So quite close to D.C., but still a track of, like, 30 to 40 minutes each way. And, yeah, and so I'm like, what in the world was I doing, you know? But, yeah, I got up to 18 classes. And that was kind of my max. And then, but as you as you mentioned earlier, also doing private sessions. And so, right. yeah, I think you know, I made like eighteen thousand dollars or something my first few years. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I guess there was a time in my life where I just I didn't need as much money either. You know, like my low overhead overhead was so low. You know, my apartment rent was really low in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, no less, which is wow. unheard of now. But there was a time when I just I didn't need to make a lot of money. You know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was like, if if my expenses are covered, I'm fine, you know? And that was kind of my thing for those first few years. And it felt like in a way, like I was that you were free to pursue it, you know, like you didn't have the overhang of like having to be a business. Like there was no social media posts and there was none of that. It was just going to class and like learning yoga. Right. There was no checking your email in between all of this. You uh-uh. know, it was just like, you sit on. yeah, it was it, so different. I would, I remember like I would chant mantras on the way to class in my head. And so I just, there was like, I, it was just a, such a different time. Wow. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So when does it like move out of your apartment and into an external space? Yeah, so later that fall that I left kind of full-time employment, went out on my own in July of 2000, I think by September, October, I began renting space at this beautiful church just right down the street. I was located on 16th Street. It was right down the street, beautiful kind of old uh, parlor space, and that's really when the studio started to grow. Um, Yeah, so that was fall of, of 2000. Okay, so it kind of went pretty quick for you. Yeah, and you know, it really grew at that point. So we were there about two and a half years, and we really grew there by, I mean, total word of mouth. Because, of course, we didn't have a sign in front of the church going, like, Trinkle Space Yoga. And, uh, you know, and really, there was a website that I had kind of, I used to do HTML coding that I just learned from some random book. So I was like, you know, webmaster, yoga teacher, secretary, receptionist, like, front desk person, janitor, you know, everything. And so I had kind of picked that up. So there was a little bit of a website, but even at that stage, people weren't going to websites to find things. You know, it was more of like they would call me and I would send, I would mail them a brochure that I had made. <laughs> <laughs> I remember there would be like those three fold pieces of yes. paper. Yeah. <laughs> that was it. Yeah. Yep. I remember making one or two of those in the early times because I was just modeling the yoga center and that's what they had. <laughs> right, exactly. And they and it never quite fit right on the threefold. It was never quite centered. You know, I know. It was just like, you know yeah. later on, it's so funny how we talked about how little things that become rituals or things that you have in mind early on that stick with you, that always stuck with me. And then when I opened my center, I made a point of making like really nice palm cards that you could yes. put on your fridge that mm-hmm. like were at good paper and like, cause it didn't cost that much. And I always felt like having a good thing that you can grab from that little basket while you're walking by and put on your fridge 
was one of the best kind of advertisings I ever did. And if it was just like a three-fold piece of paper, like on some crappy thing, it, no one would ever want to put that on their fridge. But if it kind of looked nice and the schedule was right there, that was always my plan. My, my, and I think it was pretty effective for a long time. But now everybody's on their phones. <laughs> Right, right, which is, which is amazing, right? I know. I know. All right, so you rent space in a church. That's not a tranquil space yet, right? So how long are you in the church renting space? We were there for about two and a half years. And ju- in June of '03 is when we moved into our first commercial space. And it was a two-level, 2,000-square-foot uh, space right off DuPont Circle. And it was just darling, really, really sweet space. Had you already been organizing more classes than yours at the church and had like other teachers or was it just you there still? Yeah, I started a teacher training back in 02 okay. so that, you know, maybe I could have a day off or, you know, things along those lines at some point. And yeah, and so I started what I had gone through was a 33-hour training with that woman that I mentioned who brought in her teacher from Florida. Yeah. And so I, it was 33 hours. So I thought, oh, well, I'll do a 33 hour one, you know, just to kind of like be able to teach the basics, how to teach a class, things along those lines. I mean, we should note there was no like yoga lines 200 nope. hour then, right? Mm-mm, so people were just all. doing whatever they wanted to do. There was no like idea of 200 hour yet. Nope, not at yeah. all. And yeah. I remember actually when I did create our 200 hour program, that next year, I actually was in touch with Yoga Alliance, mm-hmm. like, you know, the person who was kind of running the curriculum setup and going back and forth with her to make sure I could get it to a standard that they were, you know, hoping to kind of bring forth. So it's so funny, like back in the early days, yeah, you know, I had created this, what we call now level one, mm-hmm. which is just a way for people to kind of dabble and like, do I want to teach um, and learn, you know, some basic philosophy, but really like a lot of just how to teach a class and um, the dialoguing, the assist, things along those lines. And so, yeah, so that's what I did in O2. And then I, I led a few trainings all on my own, all 33 hours and and brought in some teachers and actually quite a few of them uh, seven of them are actually still with me like 15 years later wow i mean it's very interesting to me because i remember i was studying with a woman named allison west in new york city and she i had studied with her for a couple of years and then the yoga alliance kind of emerged and kind of announced this 200 hour thing and then she like you I think when that happened, a number of people said, oh, okay, now there's this 200-hour thing, and they they just took it on and, and created 200-hour trainings. Um, and then it's interesting to me that you you did what like became the model for yoga centers now, which is to train up a bunch of teachers so you have a staff. <laughs> right. And when you do that, it's there's a certain um, kind of, harmony often because they all came through that training with you and it's your place and that often makes for a more harmonious center i found absolutely and we never in the history of the studio brought on anyone who was not trained by us so that there Mm. was this level of consistency within the classes and the experience right okay so you so in your mind did you I don't know. How did you think of it, like growing it and making it thing? Like, did you, were you just always entrepreneurial as a person or like, how did you envision creating this larger space and making more yoga possible? It's funny because, you know, I've never studied business or really known much about what even business was. You know, I, I have a degree in, or had a degree in psychology at that point and and then while we were in the church, I, I got my master's in women's studies. So there was never really this um, business sort of acumen, but I think I just knew what I wanted and what I uh, would want as a consumer and what I wanted to bring forth really for Washington, D.C. And the book that I read that I find to be kind of the small business Bible and has very much influenced the way in which I created and ran my business was The e Do you know that book? I do not. What's it called? The E-Myth, E-Myth, and E stands for entrepreneurial. The E-Myth. All right. Well, what was it about this book that so helped you? 
Well, so basically, the premise behind it, A, it's all about creating an experience. And then B, if you create a business that can't run without you, you don't have a business, you have a job. C, oh my gosh, that's amazing that you said that because I had a talk, I don't know, maybe six months ago, and Andrew Tanner from the Yoga Alliance, as a matter of fact, made that very point to me. He said, there's a difference between having a business and owning your job. And I had never really thought of that. I have always just owned my job for the most part, although I have now kind of dabbled into what it is to actually have a business. But that is a fundamental, important uh, 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 distinction to make. Absolutely. I mean, it's critical. And so that's why, you know, whenever I started this teacher training in 02, you know, it's like that way people, students can still come to the studio and have an experience similar to what I would offer, but I can actually be away doing another training or taking a day off or, you know, doing something else to refill the well. And so the other thing that's really big about that book is the importance of creating systems, you Mm. know, so that Every time the phone answered, that there's like this sense of consistency. We always had like a before class checklist, a during class checklist, an after class checklist, you know, all these sorts of things to make sure the studio and all these moving parts that developed as the studio grew, ideally, and of course, this didn't always happen, but ideally had a consistent experience so that if you walked into our studio, no matter who was there, ideally, this is what you would experience. And that also, to me, probably explains why you managed to survive 18 years. Because after 10 years, I was completely exhausted and couldn't do it anymore, basically. Right. (laughs) right. Because I didn't have what you just said well enough. Like, I developed systems to some degree, but to develop, like you said, systems where things can operate efficiently and you're not expending a bunch of extraneous energy on stuff, you know? Right, right. <laughs> and, you know, of course, there's, you know, there's the challenges. So you walk, you know, you, you come in and you see that certain things on the checklist aren't done, right? And so there's like all the challenges around there. But at least there's a system set up that people can, you know, follow without having to memorize certain things or be like, oh, I think we're supposed to turn the music on now or, you know, whatever mm-hmm. it is. Like, so that we make sure that when the yogis walk in, they have tea and cookies available. There's nice music playing. There's a smell of lavender, you know? So whenever I say experience, that's kind of what I mean is tapping into all these senses. I think it's just really important, particularly in a busy urban setting. I agree. And it's always been interesting to me how much the littlest details matter in what you just said. Like even when you say having the smell of lavender or even that thing of like when you fold the blankets that the fringe side is in and the folded side is out and it looks nicer. Yes. And and the mats are all well arranged and stuff. Like I can't tell you how much time over the last 10 years I've just sent, spent like sorting mats to make it look nice so that when somebody walks in and they look over at that prop thing, everything looks in order and it like you think like you're in a solid place. Exactly. And it's so funny though how many times over the years I've seen like yoga center owners try to get people to help with that. And so they'll be like a note, please put the fringe side in. And sometimes they'll even be like a a picture of how they want it to look. And still it doesn't always happen. You know, people aren't always so considerate about that kind of stuff. And they usually just throw it back there, you know? (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We have little signs like that too. Not with a picture. That's actually pretty clever. <laughs> but it never works. There's still right. always people right. who completely ignore the signs. But yeah. Yeah. but it does make a difference, you know, the that those little details count and I think that's a good point. Yeah. And honestly, I think that's really what the studio to me has been all about is all these little details and the experience, you know, and I'm just going to keep saying that, but really it is like the details are what create the experience, you know, so that it's not just like your average yoga studio or, you know, a place that you walk into that's like, a you know, a more gym-like atmosphere. I always kind of said I wanted Tringle Space to be like cheer stands drink and you know, some listeners may be like, what the hell is Cheers? But, you know, some of you yeah. may remember there was a TV Norm. show. Back in the day. Norm! Norm! Exactly, right? Yeah. And people wanted to see Norm and they were happy he was there. Everybody and, knows your name. That's yes. the way the song went, right? Exactly. Yes, you know. Yeah, but um, I know. I just dated myself maybe. But I also agree with you. But it's an interesting thing that you're saying because that, that quality 
of a yoga center is a little bit different than some of the newer, more spa-like models. Right. Where it's more uh, designed and and you don't have it where, like you're describing, where I basically put my hands on every inch of the space at one mm-hmm. time or another. And that kind there because there's a kind of a quality to that when it has that kind of personal touch. Right. All right. So you open, you sound, sounded like a pretty big space. You said a two level space to move in for tranquil space. How big was the space? Yeah. So it was 2000 square feet. So it had two studios. Okay. And what we did basically is I think we went from like 18 classes to like 38, you know, which was like, oh my gosh, this yeah. is huge. And, you know, throughout this whole time period, I was funding the studio um, through the revenue that would come in. So I didn't take out any loans until. If you are hearing this message, then you're listening to the free version of J. Brown Yoga Talks. To hear the rest of our conversation, please subscribe to Podcast Premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium.